Hello, this is Christopher Grunland, and while I normally share stories on Not About Lumberjacks, something a little bit different this time. If you're here strictly for fiction, you could just skip over this, but if you're interested in podcasting fiction and what it takes to put together a show, you might like this episode. I'm sharing a talk today that I gave to the Podcast Dallas group on June 7th, 2016. It was a good turnout that evening, and I thought it might be interesting to share the talk here for those interested. Well, everybody, thank you for coming out this evening. As you can see, we're going to be talking about podcasting fiction. But even though we're talking about fiction, it'll, a lot of what I talk about applies to every kind of podcast out there. I know a lot of you know me, a lot of you don't know me. For those who don't know me, my name is Christopher Grunland, and I pay the bills as a writer. During the day, I'm a technical writer for a large software firm serving the travel industry. And then in my free time, I write fiction, articles, and other things to supplement that income. When it comes to podcasting, I started in 2010 with a fiction podcast. My very first novel is a humorous coming-of-age story about a family traveling cross-country in a possessed station wagon, and I released that story, Hell Comes with Wood Panel Doors, in 2010. Currently, as Mitch mentioned, I do a show. That show is called Not About Lumberjacks, and it's a monthly fiction show. It's just a short story that I put out, and as Mitch said, there's a lot of production on it that I'll show you how I do. And every week with Sean Kupfer, who's sitting back in the corner, I do a show called Men in Gorilla Suits. In fact, tomorrow will be our 175th episode, and you know, it's just pretty much a topic a week that we talk about. You've probably noticed there's a little address down here, ChristopherGrunland.com slash podcast Dallas. All the slides for this presentation and the two previous talks that I've done are at that location. So if you're about to take a picture, I usually try to pause long enough, but if I do move on, the slides are all going to be available. So let's talk about this evening. I'm thankful that everybody's here. And even though we're going to be talking about fiction, I hope everybody, regardless of what you're doing and where you're at in the whole process, walks out of here with at least a, a few things that you can e either immediately do to improve an existing show or finally have the courage to do it because I'll show you how easy that can be. If you have any questions, I just ask that you write them down and then afterwards we'll have a Q&A. So we'll get through this and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So let's begin by stepping back to the year 2005. In 2005, a friend, I went over to a friend's house and he said, do you know about podcasts? And I was like, yeah, I, I listened to a couple even. He said, do you know about fiction podcasts? I was like, I had no idea. And he told me to listen to Escape Pod and this guy named Scott Sigler who was doing this thing called Earthcore. And while they weren't the kinds of things I would normally listen to, I thought it was really cool that people were doing fiction and releasing it serially because... I grew up with families who talked about old radio dramas, and that appealed to me. And he also introduced me to patiobooks.com, where you could just get entire novels for free. So that was all cool, and I finally, in 2010, as I mentioned, did my first show, Hell Comes with Wood Panel Doors. In just the five or six years since then, podcasted fiction today has become a very big thing with some of the largest shows out there on the number one spot in iTunes. Um, Alice Isn't Dead, The Message, which is done by GE Podcast Theater, and Welcome to Night Vale are some of the bigger shows out there. Welcome to Night Vale is so big that they do live shows. They fill theaters, like big theaters, as in July 11th, they will be here in Dallas at the Majestic Theater, and the tickets are going for, you know, anywhere between $30 on up to well over 100 and they fill these things. They sell out. They also had a book debut on the New York Times bestseller list when they did a novelization of their show. And it debuted number four, which is would have gone number one, except some guy named Grisham and Stephen King and some other names also had books coming out that week. But 
that's enough about me and all these other people. Let's talk about you and what you're doing. Again, as I mentioned, I hope that everybody, even if you're not interested in podcasting fiction, can go through this and see how easy it is and that it's doable. I mean, if Sean and I could do 175 episodes without missing a week, you can at least do a little block of episodes. If you're new, before you begin, I always recommend ask yourself this. If nobody showed up, would you still do it? If only 10 people listened at first, would you still do your show? And I think the answer has to be yes. Because some of those shows I showed you earlier were shows that didn't really have much of a following. And then over the course of a couple of years, they became very big shows. When you do fiction as a podcast, it's not like a weekly opinion show where there's not really the sequence that carries on to the next week or like Sean and I pick a random topic, we talk about it. But the minute you begin telling a story, you are asking for a certain investment from your audience. And let's just pretend as an example that Sean decides he's going to do a fiction story about a young woman who dreams about flying. She's not dreaming that she wants to be a pilot. She's dreaming that she is physically flying. And then she starts realizing that the dreams are stress induced. And one day she's looking around her apartment. She's like, what's this? This is from the dream. This is something I don't have. So she realizes she's not sleepwalking. She's sleep flying. People start getting into the story and she decides, okay, if stress makes me fly in these dreams, I'm going to jump out my window. I'm going to fly or die. Everybody's hooked on this. They can't wait till the next week. They're like, Sean, man, you're doing something great. And then Sean, what does he do? He stops because he's only getting a handful of downloads. And just like so many shows before, the crowd is angry, <laughs> tired, exhausted of shows that don't finish. So if you're going to do something, especially fiction, finish it because you never know how it's going to grow over time. But even if you just want to do an interview show or you're doing something for a business or anything like that, pick a number, 25 episodes. I'm going to do it for a year. I'm going to do this thing regardless. And I guarantee by the time you get through that cycle, you're going to have things that you've improved and you're going to have a lot of feedback that feels really, really good. Now I know that taking something like a novel is a big thing, or if you're doing a show like black tapes or something like that, you're essentially assuming the role of like a television producer planning out, you know, potentially years of stories, but it doesn't have to be big. You can think small and you can start out small. And by that, I mean just little five to 10 minute episodes that have a definite ending. You're going 10 episodes, 15, 20 episodes. Perfect example of this is a guy named Rick Coast who does a show called The Behemoth. This morning, episode 17 came out and people who listen to the show are excited because from episode one, he told us this is 20 episodes. It's only seven to 10 minutes, so there's not much of an investment in time. And this show has grown to the point where he has enough of a following where now he has a show in July already lined up and ready to go. And he's starting to do stuff for a show that he's going to be doing in November. Both of those are 16 episodes, but sticking to that small idea, it's just Rick. And then he finds friends or people that he can pay a little bit of money to, to do the voices. A few days ago, he was featured on the first page of iTunes, which Actually, in this case, he was there right next to Welcome to Night Vale and all these other shows. And this was not like a new and noteworthy thing. This was you went in, you opened up podcasts, and here's this thing about modern radio drama. And now he's getting this huge influx of listens. And he just recently had somebody come forward and say, the show you're starting in July, I want to sponsor it. What are your rates? So even though he's small, you're small too, I'm small, and, but you could become something huge as long. And the good thing about being small 
is you have the ability to be flexible. You don't have to go to Tim and to everybody else and Dan and Sean and Tommy and say, and James, you know, the committee, what do I need to do? You could just do it. And that's the benefit of being small. So now that we have that out of the way, we're gonna talk about actually putting together a complete episode or several episodes, which begins with an idea, planning, the story, the recording, editing and getting it out there. And again, it pertains to almost any kind of podcast that you could think of. When it comes to ideas, a lot of times when people talk to writers, they want to know where the ideas come from. And it can be a frustrating answer because they'll either say, I don't know, or they'll probably say everywhere. And it's not really a specific answer and it's frustrating, but it's true. There are ideas everywhere as long as you daydream, as long as the moment your mind has a moment to itself, you don't go straight to your phone and look into, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You could find ideas in your phone, but if you occasionally just drive without listening to music, without even blasphemy, I know, listen to podcasts and you just start looking around and you start seeing people and wondering what are their stories. And then you begin playing with what if, how, why. And because I always like to, if I tell you to do something, I always like to prove it can be done. I came up with this slide a few weeks ago. And that evening I was going for a walk with my wife and I said, okay, if I'm going to say it's this easy that it is everywhere, I need to go on this walk and come back with an idea. We were out walking. I heard some noise probably about from here to where that car is just outside that window in some trees, two coyotes. So I was like, okay, this is, uh, if I'm going to say there are ideas everywhere, coyotes, sure, let's run with that. What if it wasn't my wife and me? What if I was just a person who had a job in a cubicle and I was just kind of this quiet, meek person? And what if instead of a werewolf, this is a were coyote and I'm bitten. And we play off of certain native lores that say that the coyote is the trickster spirit or kind of this vital life force. And what if on, instead of the night of the full moon, I don't attack Mitch and eat him like a werewolf. What if on the night of the full moon, I become the life of the party? I'm this boring person, <laughs> but when the moon is full, you want to be around me. And then I was like, life of the party. There's an idea for a story. I probably won't do anything with it. Anybody wants it, it's yours. But that's how easy it is. And I know it's, I'm saying it, that's how easy it is, but I've trained myself to do this. And if that seems difficult, you can force yourself to come up with ideas. Here is another example from an episode of Not About Lumberjacks. I recently did a story called The Other Side. And the way this came about, I was at work on my lunch break. I had 20 minutes left. And I told myself, okay, for 15 minutes, I'm going to write down one line ideas for stories. And then I'm going to take the one I like best and give it five minutes. The line that got me is here. Guy sneaks into childhood home. He breaks into his house. So then I start thinking the whole what if and why. Well, he goes in because when he was a kid, in the back of his closet was a portal to this other place that he called the other side. And then I was like, ooh, other side, there's the name. And then I start saying, well, why would he do such a thing? Why would he risk getting arrested? Well, he's been laid off. He's recently divorced. He's bummed and he wants to go back to the time when he was happy. More what ifs. What if the portal's there? Does he go or not? Or maybe the portal was never there. Maybe it was his imagination. Something happened in the past that caused this. Or maybe what if instead of the reason the portal is closed isn't because anything he did, people from the other side, maybe good people he knew, maybe bad people, maybe he has to fight these people, came through and they now own his childhood home. Obviously that's what I went with because I put in all caps, yes. And obviously that's not what the story is actually totally about. But at the moment in those five minutes, that's how easy it was to come up with a story idea. Again, it does take practice, but if you are open to ideas, if you're in the line at the grocery store and you're looking at people and you start thinking, 
What if that person had superpowers? What if this, per you know, you just start thinking stories and then kind of teasing them out just seriously, just with what if, how, and why, you'll find yourself with more ideas than you know what to do with. So once that's done, you have your idea, the one that you're gonna go with, it's time to plan things. This is some people's favorite part, and then other people, it seems kind of daunting because now it's going to become real. Now it's a big undertaking. And if you have never written a novel, at some point, if you're going to write a novel, you have to write a novel, and it seems huge. But the first time I wrote a novel, I just remembered that big things are made up of many little things. And all I had to do was just take these little pieces and put them together and somehow link them together. As a technical writer, I'm in the middle of a huge software release and all this new stuff is coming, but if I thought about it all, I would have a big issue, but I just break it up into little pieces. When I did Hell Comes With Wood Panel Doors, I was in my early 20s and I knew that it was the story of a family traveling cross country in a possessed station wagon to the Grand Canyon. So obviously they have to come from someplace far, so I grabbed a map physical map at the time, because you know we didn't have Google Maps in the early 90s, but I decided they're from New Jersey. And then I looked at the map in some of the places along the way, and I came up with some big stops. And if you're wondering about the Chihuahua with the red eyes, the car possesses the Chihuahua and something big happens in New Mexico before they get to the Grand Canyon. So now that I have some ideas, it's time to start putting ideas on note cards or you could do some digital note cards, things along those lines. And these are things, again, you could do if you're doing an interview show, you can still plot things out or your business, you know, it's a good way to put things out because you can shuffle note cards. And then of course you begin writing, which brings us to writing tools. And there are of course those novelists who still write first and second drafts by hand. <coughs> but at some point, all of us, almost regardless of the type of show we're doing, we go to a word processor of some sort, and there are the standards. You have, of course, Microsoft Word and Pages. But I do want to talk specifically about Scrivener. And even if you're not doing fiction, I can see certain advantages with Scrivener, not just because if you look way over there on your right, there is a little cork board with note cards that you can make digitally and shuffle around, which is really cool. What finally sold me on Scrivener was this little pane right here, the binder pane, and we'll go in for a closer look. This is why I like this. When I was younger, I worked in factories and warehouses. I ran machines and I built things with my hands. I didn't have to think about what I was doing. So all day long, I could build a story in my head, go home and write a complete draft of a short story or a chapter may not have been perfect, but I at least got something down. Now I work in these little pieces, and this is just some of the stuff from that story I mentioned the other side. You can see here these story elements. I just kind of sketch things out. My wife is an artist. I have a lot of artist friends, and I love watching them build an image of some sort. This is now how I write. I've changed completely where, okay, present day, we have a guy breaking it. You know, if you click that, it opens and says there's a guy breaking into his childhood home and it goes back and forth. And it allows me to not manage this big story in Word where I have to scroll and it's like, where's that? I can get right to it. It's also neat because if I'm doing, if Sean and I or Tim and I were doing a fiction podcast or something like that, we can use this for a story Bible by keeping track of all our characters, all their little quirks, things that have happened so we have continuity keep place, you know, track of all the places and research. But there are plenty of other things out there too that you can use. You don't have to use something like Scrivener, but I think people like Scrivener because you can also output eBooks very easily. And that's a good way to monetize what you're doing because unless you're doing certain things like the crew from Welcome to Night Vale are doing, it's probably gonna be your first steps if you're interested in monetization. But I do know people who have plotted everything in Trello, which is an online to-do thing. Sean has written entire novels, both in Notepad and on his phone. 
There is a literary writer named Bud Smith, who's an industrial welder in New Jersey. He works on note cards, and when he has his chapter down, he takes a picture of the note card, so he has it on his phone, and on his breaks at work, he looks at that for reference and he writes. He's written books at work. So it's just a matter of finding what works for you, and when I talk about what works, I don't mean just simply, hey, this is a neat tool, because you can tinker plenty in Scrivener or if you're working in Evernote and feel like you're working, but you're not getting anything done. Find what works to actually get whatever it is in your head out there, whether it's fiction, interviews, anything along those lines. So now we have our story written. It's time to record. Recording obviously is something that can be very detailed. We could probably do a whole year of monthly meetups about certain little things with recording from working with mixers to digital recorders like the one I'm using right now. But I want to show people who are in the process of thinking about podcasting how easy it is by using something I did as an example. You do not have to have a bunch of gear or a studio. You don't have to have the super expensive microphones that NPR uses. You don't even have to have the reasonably expensive microphone. This is something that I'll probably upgrade to and then at that point I'm stopping and I promise my wife that's the last piece of gear I'll buy, except for a couple other things. <laughs> but the thing that I use most, and this is what I use with Sean, and this is what I use when I do um, the fiction show that I do, it is the Audio-Technica ATR2100, very standard with podcasters. Anywhere between 79 on the high end, usually on sale for 49 or 59. The neat thing about it, it has a USB cord, so you can go straight into your computer, or it has an XLR cable that you can go into a mixer. But I said that I wanted to show you how easy it could be, so I'm going to talk about the very first thing I did, Hell Comes with Wood Panel Doors in 2010. I used a USB microphone, it's a Samson C03U or CU, I'm dyslexic so that throws me, but it's a USB microphone. So I have this microphone, I've never recorded anything, I download this program called Audacity which is an audio editing program. If you have a Mac, you have access to GarageBand. There are plenty of other audio programs you can use. They're all going to have some similar features. So even though I use Audacity as an example later on, it still applies to other things. All I did was I plugged in my microphone. It instantly recognized the mic. I clicked record. I read my story. When I messed up my lines, which I do a lot, I just paused, regained my composure, read until I felt, okay, that's a good line, move on, edit, and I had a complete podcast. It was really, truly that simple. You do not have to make it this very complex thing. If you do anything that I think everybody in here should do, or I'll go as far as saying, well, I'm not going to say you must because I like Carl's show and they, he and his partner in crime with their podcast do it live a lot. So, and I kind of like that background noise, but if you're doing fiction, having a quiet space is very important because you can make an affordable microphone sound good if you have that quiet space. In my situation, I live in an apartment and I'm in a back room and I have the air conditioner intake right here and I share a wall with a two-year-old next door neighbor, and he is generally pretty quiet, but he's a two-year-old, so there's gonna be some bumping and banging around. I record at night when the kid is asleep and I can turn the AC up so it clicks off. I record quickly. My wife is very patient and, you know, because in Texas it gets hot even at night, but that's what it takes to have the quiet environment. Some people go into a closet and record. Some people build their own sound booths. But the quiet is important. I think another thing that's important that we really, I don't think we've ever really chatted at any of these meetups is saving your voice. Because when you're doing fiction especially, you're assuming the role of a voice actor. You might be doing different genders. You might be doing something, someone angry screaming. You might even be doing the voice of an African gray parrot named Horace. And if my wife were here, 
she could tell you how much fun that was because she narrated an episode in which there was a character that was a parrot. So she had to really take care of her voice. I try to take care of my voice and there are a few things you definitely do not want to do before you record. I'll get through that and then we'll talk about the good things. The first two things I break when Sean and I record a lot, but when I record fiction, I never break these rules. Don't eat before you record because, or drink coffee because it dries you out. Even if you don't have food allergies, you're scratching your throat and <clears throat> you'll start, even if you don't have any allergies, you're just not going to have that vocal range. And definitely don't drink while you're, you know, shortly before you're recording, especially spirits, because they will dry you out and you'll get this little dry snap. You can hear the effects of this sometimes on men in gorilla suits because that show exists mostly for an excuse for Sean and I to make sure that we never don't hang out. I see him more than I see friends I've had for 25 years because he's the friend who's like, sure, I'll do a podcast with you. And I've seen him more than anybody. Also, because we live in Texas, consider allergies if you have them. I went for a walk one night with my wife, came home, I was all ready to record, listened to it the next morning, and it was just like this horrible sounding voice. So I had to re-record because of allergies. A lot of us have allergies, so something to consider for those who live in Texas. But the good things we can do, there are plenty of good things. You can do vocal exercises. I'm not going to stand here and do any vocal exercises, but if you go to Google, type vocal exercise or singing exercises, you will get people on YouTube showing you how to do things. You'll see people making funny faces, loosening muscles up. I personally don't do this, but I have friends who are professional voice actors in animation and commercials, and there's probably a reason they're professional and I'm not. Practicing is important too, not just getting familiar with the story you're reading or if you're doing interviews, the questions, so that you can kind of break away and just run with certain ideas, but actually practicing the voices. This bit me one time on Not About Lumberjacks when I was doing a character with an accent that I didn't really practice and over the course of the story you can hear a little shift. It's not so bad that I went back and re-recorded it, but there was another thing in that story. It's a weird story about a guy who has a magic, magic eight ball, the little thing you shake and it gives you the answer. He has a magic eight ball that always gives him the correct answer. So if he knows the right questions to ask, he can see the future. So because he has this thing and people know it, they're coming for him trying to take this thing. So he breaks it open. There's a little cylinder of blue liquid inside that if you drill into, you can drink the liquid. I can attest to young kid, it doesn't taste very good. But in this, for the sake of the story, by drinking this liquid, he now hears the voice in his head giving the answers. I had no idea. I didn't even think about what does a Magic 8 Ball voice sound like. Had I practiced, I would have known. So at the end, I'm sitting in the room just reading lines trying to come up with something. It could have been a stronger episode if I had practiced. Posture is also important, whether you're seated or you're standing, you don't want to be so rigid and stiff, but you don't want to be hunched over because if you're hunched over, first your mic technique is going to be bad, but you're also going to have that Darth Vader intake. But if you're kind of, you know, up a little tall, you get that natural intake and that's not even really a detriment to a story. So posture is important because it also keeps you about four inches from the mic and gives you good mic habits. If you do stand, I will say, if you're like me, remind yourself to stay focused because I can jump around and that's bad mic technique. And also pamper your voice. There's nothing wrong with that. I have water right here, which I'm going to take a sip. But there is a soprano opera singer who swears by Yogi Throat Comfort Tea. She loves it because it opens everything up. There is a baritone singer and he loves Echinacea Tea with a little bit of honey, a little bit of lemon juice and ginger. Another person who just totally brutalizes his voice and his body is an, a an actor named Andy Serkis. Andy Serkis is known for motion capture acting 
and is the voice of Gollum from the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies. That is totally this raspy, horrible voice and the damage done to his throat over days and days of recording was huge. And in one of the Hobbit DVDs, the extra stuff, they talk about how he came up with this concoction that they called Gollum juice. And it's just simply steaming water with, you know, they get a little bit of ginger, peel it, dice it up. You could put it in a tea ball, hang it in the water for 10 to 15 minutes. And then they put a little lemon juice, honey, and he liked cinnamon in it. So that's optional, but this is something that saved his voice. And honey is really important because, or not, sorry, not honey. Lemon juice is good because it breaks up the viscosity of saliva. So you're not getting that ropey, mouth smacky sound. So at the very least, lukewarm water with some lemon juice will help break up some stuff that your voice is going to be really good and strong. So now that we have all that done, our story is now recorded. We've taken care of our voice. It all sounds good. Now it's time to put it together. Again, this looks a little busy. This is the story of the other side. Most of my stories probably just have the little audio track and a few things in here, but I'll break down what you're looking at here. There is the actual story track, me reading the story, the intro and the outro. There's always the sound of chopping wood at the beginning of an episode of Not About Lumberjacks. Music comes in, music fades out, you hear the chopping and you know the episode's done. I like musical interludes to kind of have if there's a shift in time or a shift in theme, anything like that. And I'm going to talk about how I lay music in because it's something that I think pertains to almost any podcast. And of course, the fun thing about fiction, sound effects. So when it comes to music, a lot of people always ask, where can I get royalty free music? This is always a top question. and. These are some of the sites that I've had luck with. In fact, I found gemendo.com through a search on Creative Commons. I really just would recommend freemusic.org, but the neat thing about Gemendo is I found the band that I used for Hell Comes With Wood Panel Doors. They're a surf band out of Liege, Belgium, which is a weird thing to have a surf band out of this working class town in Belgium. But six years after I've done that podcast, I'm still friends with them. We chat regularly. So even if nothing ever happened and I never sold any ebooks of that story, I made some really good friends. I mentioned that you can find music, images, video clips, all kinds of things at search.creativecommons.org. And the search is very easy and there's a really nice checkbox that you can even use for commercial purposes. That way you know that what you're <coughs> using, you have the clearance to actually use it. I mentioned freemusicarchive.org because that's what I use the most. The search is very intuitive, so I won't get into that, but I will show a little trick. If you find a certain musician that you really love, let's say instead of having 568 tracks, they had only four or five tracks, but you wanted a similar sound, if you scroll down and look on the left at the related artists, the algorithm on the site is really good about finding something that's going to keep in that whole thematic feel, as well as sometimes even picking up similar licenses. So freemusic.org is, freemusicarchive.org is a really good place to go. I talked about how to put music in, and I do want to talk about that, because again, this pertains to almost, you know, everybody, I hear a lot of people who will do an interview show where they do commentary, then they go into the interview. And some people have always asked me, how do you even just put a music track in that rises and fades? Obviously you could see the music is soft, it gets louder, and then it gets soft again. I obviously like to have a little bit of narration when I bring the music in, I fade the music in, and then at the end I fade it out after the little interlude. That's as simple as just highlighting a section, you know, about that much, and in Audacity going to effect fade in or effect fade out. If you're in GarageBand, it's a similar thing. You're always going to be able to find a fade in or a fade out. But people always ask, then how do you get the music to rise? And again, it's Audacity, but a lot of other programs will have similar features. 
If you look up sort of to the left, there's this little icon. And the minute you click that, you get the music track that you can put points on it. And if I have this music track that extends out and I put a point on it and drag down, music gets soft. I can then put an anchor point here, another here and drag it up, and that's how the music rises. Another anchor point, another click, drag it down, everything's good. Music has now come in, rises, falls. And the final thing I like to do is end while there's still narration or a character speaking, because if I have the story track going, the music going, and a sound effect going, and it all stops at once, it's very distracting unless that's something, an effect I'm going for, like, you know, squealing car tires and then just boom, everything stops. Otherwise, I like to just have that nice fade out like this. Sound effects are a really fun part of doing podcasted fiction. And I do know people who use sound effects even in other types of shows. You can go to Google, you could type royalty free sound effects, or you could just go to freesound.org. Freesound.org, they've never spam me. You just sign up with an email address, come up with a, your password, and then you have access to it. In this example, I just went up to the search and typed leaves in the wind. This is what it presented to me, and this is why I like this particular site is over here. The filtering capability is nice because I can go by file type, I can go by sample rate, I can go by user and further those things down so I'm not scrolling through as many pages. But the way that I, the thing I really love about this site is the way it makes recognizing totally royalty free sounds available. I'll zoom in. This little zero in the circle means this person has made a sound that they have loaded that you can use even for commercial purposes. It's not even like Creative Commons where you have the Creative Commons icon and you click it and then it's, okay, with attribution, I can do this, but not for commercial. Okay, well this guy, okay, she's finally loaded something that I can use. This allows you to just scan very easily and just, I. Once I narrow my search, I scroll and look for that zero, listen to the sounds, find what I need, and drop it in. On very rare occasions, you might find that you don't find the sound. There's nothing preventing you from doing it yourself. With the other side, there was a sound of somebody who comes home from work and just does the, tosses the keys on the counter. Every sound I was finding was kind of jangly. It didn't have that impact sound. I grabbed this recorder, just held it here, tossed my keys a few times. My wife is used, and she's, you know, he's recording something. And I made the sound myself. It's that easy. And then, of course, it's always nice if you upload the sound and if you use royalty free sounds, give it that same kind of license, share with everybody else because they're sharing with you. We are now done with the complete episode. We've edited, we've done everything except get it out there. Again, this is a topic that we can do at least a series of evenings about getting things out there. But I want everybody to keep thinking about that small idea I mentioned earlier. Because of course there are all the typical places. You can load your show to iTunes, you can go to social media, and all these things are great, especially if you have a very good following that believes in what you're doing, that works. But with so many more people getting into podcasting, it's a little bit of saturation. And with media companies coming in, it's going to be even more saturation. So being small, you have the ability to think about different ways without a huge committee to get your work in front of people in front of the actual fans, going to where the people who actually listen to the kind of stuff you're doing, even if they're not podcast fans, I'd say especially if they're not podcast fans, you know, if you're a contractor and you're doing stuff about houses, if you're at a conference, you're probably going to be the only contractor or one of the few contractors in a place like that with a podcast, where if you go to a good conference like podcast movement, you're going to have nothing but podcasters around you. So when you start seeing where the fans are, you can actually be kind of this little minor celebrity. 
with fiction, patiobooks.com is a great thing because once your story is done, you just load it in chapters. And to give you an example of the success I've had with patio books, again, I'm not really, I'm more of a hobbyist, but with patio books, I, well, with my actual website for Hell Comes with Wood Panel Doors, I get about 300 downloads a month. And this is after years of the story being out there. With patio books, I still get about 3,000 downloads a month. Yeah, it's not the thousands a day like it was when I first loaded it and you're on that front page of patio books, but I'm still getting decent numbers with something that I don't even promote. I haven't even said Hell Comes with Wood Panel Doors until this, it's, it's been months. I don't promote this book really anymore, but people are still finding it and emailing me and saying, hey, I love this. You have the ability to do live shows. And I know you might be thinking, I'm not important enough to do a live show, but you can. Dan Franks sits back there. He does a show called Men Seeking Tomahawks. He and his partner have done live shows around Denton. I think you guys did one at a taco restaurant before. Okay, so at a taco restaurant. You might think, why would you do a show at a taco restaurant? Well, of course, he's going to have some friends there, but then there are going to be all these other people who are like, what's this? and they can hear it and they're interested. So again, they're in a place where it's not like, hey, we're with 400 other podcasters. It's we're kind of the main attraction, even though it's a small venue. And even if that didn't work for them, they're practicing because you never know when people who did Welcome to Night Vale started out, they weren't sitting there going with this big plan saying we're going to do this and this and this and then hit all those points. It was all right, we're gonna do some rough shows and get that out of our system so that when we're filling you know, a theater in Dallas, like the Majestic, we know what we're doing. Another place that a lot of people I don't think really think about when it comes to podcasts, again, this is a little bit more specific toward fiction or if you have sort of a geeky show. My first writing that I was paid for was comic books independent comic books. I met my wife, an artist at a company in 1992. So when we used to go to comic book conventions, comic book conventions were largely comic book conventions. Now they are huge media conventions. And on top of that, the audience is podcast savvy. You don't have to sit there and explain what a podcast is. You don't have to explain what a, you know, you mention your show and they have their phone out and they're like, all right, got it. If Sean and I were really in, interested in having larger numbers with, um, I was going to say men seeking tomahawks, no, men in gorilla suits, we would go to a convention, an affordable one, get a table. I would be in a gorilla suit. Sean would be in a gorilla suit. The heads would be on displays and we would be talking to people because we talk about enough geeky things that we could justify this. So you may not think, okay, well, I'm, I, what I do doesn't pertain to comic conventions, but what I want you to do is start thinking, okay, that's true. But what, the thing that you're doing, what is the equivalent of this? Obviously with fiction, book festivals. This was the Unbound Book Festival up in Columbia, Missouri in April, the inaugural season. I went up there because a friend put it together and I had a blast. And again, I was the only person in this crowd podcasting fiction. And yes, the crowd was largely older, largely female. And oddly, most of the fiction that I do, my audience tends, because some of it can border on literary, my audience is largely female and older. So they were just like, oh, you do a, you know, and they were just so interested, like you do a podcast and they were interested in it because there's nobody else around podcasting. Podcast movement, obviously have to mention podcast movement. Dan's busy putting it together up in Chicago. And the thing that I like that they've done is they really have put a little bit more emphasis on different types of shows. This next thing I'm going to say is not a knock at podcast movement, but if I travel to do a show, because there are so many actual business podcasters there, if I were really wanting to do something different, I would hit something like NerdCon Stories or I would hit VidCon. And the reason I would hit those over something that's totally an industry conference 
is these conventions offer fan tickets. So you're not going to have somebody who's in high school, unless they're really serious about podcasting, traveling to Chicago and paying you know, money for a very good, legit conference, but $25 to go chum around with all these people. And yeah, I'm networking with them and they might be, they might look like total geeks and stuff, but they're people there to consume stories. If I'm at a conference that's largely business, I think that's great, but that's not what I'm doing. So again, by thinking small, I would seek out conferences like this. We're really only limited by our imagination in the way that we promote what we do. And as podcasting continues to grow, it's in all of our best interest to think, how do I get into those places where I'm one, maybe five other podcasters, but preferably I'm the only podcaster at this book festival and people think that's cool. So we've gone through the whole process. We have come up with our idea. We have planned it. We have written it. We've recorded it. We've edited it and it's out there. We've done it. I hope you see how easy it is. And I want to close with three things that I think pertain to everybody. And not just as podcasters, I think these pertain to us as humans. First thing, always strive for more. When I start a new novel, I try to write the novel. I look at my ideas and I take the idea that I don't think I'm capable of writing because that challenges me. And I found that if I work hard, I can rise to that occasion. One of the other reasons I went to the book festival up in Missouri is something that I wrote was kind of chosen for this panel with an agent, an editor, and some best-selling novelists critiquing openings of novels. Because I pushed myself, I now have some open doors for the kind of fiction that I've always been writing. So that would not have happened if I didn't push myself. If I just wrote this, and there's nothing wrong with writing the same kind of story repeatedly, but for me, I like that challenge. And it doesn't have to be even your content. It could just be your quality. You listen to some of our early episodes. They're horrible sounding. I wouldn't say horrible. We, we have a couple horrible sounding episodes, but now we have some really good sounding episodes and I used a lot of that with fiction and now the shows that I do sound good. Support other people. Give a talk like this. I try to do a talk every single year at this group because I like the community and when I'm sitting over there, I've learned a lot. So I felt that it's important to me to actually come and talk, but it doesn't have to be even doing a talk. It's checking in on Carl or Tommy or, you know, all these different people that I know from here and just seeing what they're up to. And sometimes you might contact someone and they're like, Hey, I'm trying to come up with this new idea or, you know, something along those lines and you can support them. They support you with fiction. A lot of times people look back in history and say, would have been cool to be part of a literary movement like the romantics or the beats or something like that. What a lot of people don't realize is they might be part of something that's about to blow up right now. And the way that you become part of that is you do the work, you support others and you stay in touch with them. Finally, the last thing, have fun. I think that's vital because I don't have to drive from Roanoke to Richardson to hang out with Sean and record episodes. I don't have to record fiction. I don't even have to write, but I do all of these things because it's fun. And because it's fun, it's something that I go to and I can actually see improvement over time. I can carry that over to other things. I've gained so much confidence from doing it because I have fun. I hope everybody here not only walks out of here this evening with a few ideas, I hope that the little bit of time that you have given me has been fun and I've done my job. Thank you. Mm -hmm.